A very good evening, good afternoon, good morning, variously from uh, the different panelists who are joined uh, this seating of the International Tribunal of Natural Justices, a Judicial Commission of Inquiry into Weaponization of the Biosphere. This is the third uh, seating that's taking place through the virtual court uh, since we began uh, looking at the quote unquote uh, corona pandemic and all of the attendant hysteria and in some cases very serious issues uh, connected to, to, the, to, to the situation that we're all facing us. Uh, we're all coming to you mostly from our homes. Uh, no small secret, most people of the world, certainly in the developing world, uh, in the developed world, are uh, having to be cloistered uh, in the privacy of their own homes. I'd like to uh, briefly introduce uh, some of the um, experts who have joined uh, this uh, hearing. Initially, I'd like to welcome Dr. W. John Martin, who is a medical director of the Institute of Progressive Medicine within uh, MI Hope Incorporated, a nonprofit US uh, public charity specializing in the study of viruses causing mental illnesses. He received his medical degree from the University of Sydney in 65 and PhD degree, University of Melbourne in 1970. He is a board certified in both anatomic and clinical pathology with subspeciality qualifications in immunopathology and in medical microbiology. Using molecular assays and specialized virus culture techniques, he pioneered research leading to the detection of stealth-adapted viruses. I'll repeat that, stealth-adapted viruses and the alternative cellular energy, ACE pathway. He explains the ACE pathway in terms of a natural energy force termed Kelia, kinetic energy limiting electrostatic attraction. And he has further shown that water and other materials can capture and beneficially transmit Kelia to humans, animals, and plants. A very warm welcome, uh, Dr. Martin from uh, South Pasadena, California. Well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and I'm happy to contribute to this forum primarily by discussing these atypical viruses, stealth, in the sense that they do not engage the immune system. And what that is opening up is the understanding the body has mechanisms beyond the immune system to fight off viruses and those mechanisms can be brought to play against coronaviruses. Very, very good. I'll proceed and ask the, uh, and just uh, bring in Dr. Joe, uh, who is a German board certified MD with research experience and doctor thesis in virology in the post 9-11 era. Her experience spans many fields from transplant surgery to immunology to the study of the electrome of the human body. In the current situation, she has consulted SARS-CoV-2 positives in her country and as a local frontline caretaker. To not interfere with the interests of her clients and possible conflicts of interest, she wants to stay anonymous. Uh, she, however, offers full transparency to the trusted court officials. Indeed, she has done that and the Chief Justice and Commissioners are satisfied as to her identity. Uh, therefore, she'll be pixelated for the purposes of this seating. Welcome, Dr. Joe. I'd also like to uh, welcome uh, Judge uh, Alfred Lambermont Weber from Canada, uh, known to almost uh, all of the audience that we attract. Um, he is a famous uh, pundit uh, on the front line of truth and disclosure and has been for many long years. He's an exceptional a researcher, and he is also notable for having been a judge at the uh, Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunals, uh, which were hosted by the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, um, wherein uh, Bush and Blair were effectively found guilty of war crimes uh, against humanity. Welcome, Judge Alfred Lambermont Weber. Thank you, Sasha. We're, we're very happy and feel privileged uh, to be here. I'd also like to welcome Paramount uh, Chief Sylvester Nicale from the Côte d'Ivoire, um, who's very kindly joined us. Uh, welcome, Paramount uh, Chief Sylvester Nicale, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. I'm glad to, to join you on this uh, uh, speech. 
Thank you. I'd like to also welcome um, uh, Paula Woodley. Um, Paula, would you be so kind as to give a very brief uh, background on yourself to the court? Yes, thank you, Sasha. Um, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 40 years, actually. And I've worked in the public, private, international, and the government for close to 40 years now. And I worked at the United Nations. I've traveled pretty well to every place in the world. I've dealt with infectious diseases, worked with the government in Honolulu. And right now, I'm ready for a deployment to be working under the Department of Defense on the comfort ship in New York. This week, I'll be taking a flight there. Thank you, Paula, and you're greatly welcomed here. Um, I'd like to also, uh, at this time, welcome um, trusted faces, which you'll know from earlier hearings, um, not least our Chief Justice, uh, Sir John Walsh Branner, uh, Thomas J. Brown, ITNJ trustee, uh, ITNJ trustee, the Reverend Dr. Nancy Ash uh, from Mexico, uh, and of course, uh, Robert David Steele, uh, who is in Washington, D.C., who many of you will remember having been chief counsel for the ITNJ at the Westminster seatings in 2018 into human trafficking, child sex abuse, and another hearing on financial crimes. Uh, welcome, uh, Robert. Finally, I'd like to welcome Judge uh, Seven. Okay, I'm gonna, um, Alfred, could you kindly uh, give us the st uh, three or four minutes on the status quo as you see it relating to uh, the corona pandemic? and the attendant issues. I, I'm participating here with my fellow judge, Seven, uh, as a judge on the National and Common Law Tribunal for Public Health and Justice. Uh, we have issued, as of March 29th, 30th, 2020, findings of law and findings of fact. And in essence, I'll, uh, I'll just summarizing the, summarize the first of our findings of law. Based upon the exhaustive findings of fact above, which I should say I viewed with great interest the most recent uh, sitting of the ITNJ, and the, our findings of fact mirror your findings of fact in that sitting. Based upon the exhaustive findings of fact above, this tribunal finds that any and all mandatory quar quarantine, lockdown orders, mandatory vaccine orders, and or martial law orders made by national, any national, provincial, state, municipal, or disease control, governmental or public entities claiming alleged causal connection uh, to the COVID-19 coronavirus, which in fact is an exosome, as a high consequence infectious disease, HCID, are null and void under natural and common law. No natural person anywhere shall suffer any penalty for ignoring any provision of such mandatory lockdown orders and or martial law orders. And yesterday, uh, today is April 13th, 2020, Monday, and yesterday, Easter Sunday, April 12th, uh, 2020, we had a march here in, uh, in downtown Vancouver, BC, Canada, which members of our, uh, our Zoom cafe, which uh, occurs every Saturday at 4 p.m. Pacific and to which all persons are, are welcome, marched peacefully, not respecting the two meter rule, that is, they just marched as normal people. The police looked on peacefully, not interfering, and we just broke through the meme of the false flag. This is a medical false flag for the in attempted introduction of draconian, literally, from an exopolitical point of view, rules, and the introduction of a massive new world order. And all of it is against uh, the most cherished uh, standards uh, that have been long extant, starting with the Magna Carta, the Canadian uh, <clears throat> Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Bill of Rights in the US Constitution, and all such other standards. And so uh, I beg uh, this honorable uh, 
International Tribunal for Natural Justice to so find. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Judge Lambermont Weber, much appreciated. Uh, Chief Justice uh, Sir John, uh, would you care to comment? I can echo uh, what Judge Weber has said, that uh, uh, it's happening in various countries, and it's particularly happening uh, in Australia. In fact, uh, there was a, uh, an interview with uh, one of the politicians, and uh, they asked for comments from the public, which was shown on the screen, and the first comment was, your new past laws make this a fascist country. So that was quickly removed, but that was the, the, the comment because they have brought in past laws now in Australia. So you need documentation to go from one part of the state to another part of the state. Uh, and uh, uh, I appreciate uh, <laughs> the Vancouver people might be able to meet in a Zoom cafe on a Saturday, but that is prohibited in Australia now, that uh, you can't have uh, more than two people at any gathering, and the two people must be six feet apart from one another. So that's the new, that's the new normal. And Chief Justice, with the pandemic and the resultant state of emergency in Australia, what effect has it had on constitutional rights there? Oh, goodness. Sasha, <laughs> there are no rights. Uh, Americans find it very hard to appreciate this. Australia does not have a Bill of Rights. The United Kingdom has one. The Americans have one in their constitution. But there is no Bill of Rights in, in Australia. Now, the interesting thing is that I had a look at it from a constitutional point of view because these edicts are coming firstly from the federal government and then they're being echoed by the state governments. And looking at our constitution, and in fact, I have it here. I'll just read some interest, not all of it. It starts off as most constitutions do, whereas the people relying on the blessing of almighty God have agreed to unite in one indissoluble federal commonwealth under the crown of the United Kingdom. The important thing is the constitution says that the linking of the six states, which was six separate colonies on the Australian continent, linking them together in a federation is indissoluble. Well, my view is that the states have just dissolved the constitution because the Constitution provides free travel from one part of Australia to another, and all the states now have gone back to the status quo that they had in the 19th century, where each state was, in effect, a separate country. So now we have six smaller countries on the continent, and the federal government has basically voted itself out of office. The only thing that's keeping them in office uh, are the police who are heavily armed and patrol the streets and arrest people they think shouldn't be on the street. Uh, and uh, uh, they also asked uh, the Americans, who very kindly have sent over 2,500 uh, soldiers to help the police. So we are living under martial law. And uh, so far, uh, no one has been shot, uh, apart from one fellow in Queensland who yelled at the police, and the police in self-defence pulled out their gun and shot him. Uh, he's the first martyr that's happened. But people are being charged, being arrested, and the penalties range from six months as a minimum and up to 10 years for breaching the, the social distance rules, which means two people can talk six feet apart. The third one who turns up gets arrested. 
Right. Well, one imagines that when this is uh, all over, um, the, those uh, mandarins and officials who are vastly exceeding uh, their remit or their mandate from the people are going to be facing some very serious uh, ramifications and repercussions as well they ought. Um, I'd like to invite Robert David Steele um, to address this court and give a three or four minute uh, overview on the status quo as he sees it. Robert. I was the first one to say that this was a contrived media war and a fake pandemic. And I was proven right. I was the first to say that 5G lowers immunity and has something to do with the uh, presentation of radiation sickness, which presents as the flu. And I was right. I also, responding to Sir John's conversation with the government of Australia, posted a video in which I said very, very clearly to the Prime Minister of Australia, who was not named at the time, you're going to make this worse. And they did. This was nothing more than a normal flu. All of the numbers were fabricated. The same people that created the Trump dossier created the Imperial College study. We have been lied to by elements of the government of Great Britain and by the World Health Organization, which is led by a man who does not have a medical license and is an alleged war criminal. I think Donald Trump had this right in the beginning, but he was politically blackmailed because he was afraid that he would be shown as not caring. I think we're now back toward uh, making it right. I am, however, very concerned that the ITNJ was attacked recently in the Daily Mail, which is a scurrilous rag. I'm proud to uh, join the First Lady who has beat them in a lawsuit and got $2.9 million when they defamed her. I would be very pleased if the ITNJ took some form of legal action against the Daily Mail because they are saying that people are burning down 5G towers because of us. That's not right. I doubt anyone burning down a tower in England has ever listened to an ITNJ uh, thing. But to the end of the point here, 5G is still being denied by all governments as being in any way associated with the virus. At a minimum, 5G lowers immunity. In the middle, uh, 5G presents as radiation sickness, which can be misdiagnosed as the virus and therefore fabricate new numbers. And at worst, 5G can be used to trigger nanoparticles, which can then induce lethal biological effects down the road. So from where I sit, we have done our duty before God and country. We have told the truth. We need to keep telling the truth. And I am proud to be associated with all of you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Robert David Steele. Uh, gratitude for those words. Um, Chief Silvestre Nakale, uh, would you care to just uh, give your overview on the status quo um, as a cultural leader, Paramount Chief of Cote d'Ivoire in Africa? Uh, you have an exceptional voice. Um, please address the court on the status quo. This is pandemic uh, cases. It's a serious uh, matter for us because when the coronavirus broke out in China and in Italy, then it came to Europe. African didn't have any case at all. And we did not believe that he was coming there. I personally did not believe that we will uh, uh, know this case in Africa because we don't have any 5G antenna there yet. And if we don't have uh, 5G antennas, then this coronavirus couldn't uh, reach Africa. But we were really surprised when we understood from the Secretary General of uh, United Nations talking about being concerned with Africa. We did not understand why instead of being concerned with Europe, with Italy, with Spain, they start talking about Africa. Then the French President Emmanuel Macron, in a visit in, uh, uh, in Alsace, where he went to, to, to speak about a hospital, a military hospital, he then spoke to the French doctors, French uh, scientists, 
to go to Africa and show the know-how about this disease. So those, I start thinking, what is really going on? Because so far, Africa is not really linked to this disease. We know that all those pandemic are always starting from Africa. We know Ebola, we know uh, HIV, but this, Ebo uh, this uh, uh, coronavirus did not start in Africa. So how come all the world leaders are talking about concern with Africa? Then I, st I start receiving phone call from back home, villages, the chief from a village are complaining because the vaccination started already in the village. People were going around in village, one of my village called Siegweku, the chief wanted to understand why they were having agents going to give vaccine to children from six to six, uh, 13 years old. They did not understand what was going on. Then I said to them, just speak to the authority over there. They then caught those agents and they went to the authority in the cities. Then they found out that those people were working for organization owned by Bill Gates and they were released. Those are things that you will not see, you will not hear about in the, in the media. So people are already going, giving vaccine in my villages. So this is a serious concern because I don't believe it. there is, at this stage, there is a vaccine for Corona, but they are giving vaccine in my villages. Some videos, and phone call that I received saying that seven children died in Senegal, a village near Dakar, where people went to vaccine children in a compound. Seven of them died on streets on, on, on after the vaccination. I received also videos and phone call from Ivory Coast a small uh, village near Abidjan, the capital city called Anono, the government sent agents accompanied by police to uh, build up some tent for vaccine. The chief of village refused, the whole youth refused, they were back in the, the village uh, authority. Then they were from seven o'clock in the morning, till seven. So I don't really understand what is going on. So if this tribunal can do something about it, because no one can speak about it, if the authority is already planning this mass vaccination in Africa, I don't understand. So I just uh, uh, address this court to try and find a solution for, for what's happening really in Africa. Thank you, Chief Nakale. I would say, uh, I would say that there have been some viral uh, videos circulating in the last couple of days which appear uh, to demonstrate that there are indeed 5G towers uh, not only in standing in, in Nigeria but being burnt to the ground uh, by, by, uh, by liberators uh, who have effectively declared war against the technology on behalf of their peoples. Those are yeah. very compelling videos and don't appear uh, to be concocted or fake media. Uh, Robert Steele, uh, I'll, refer, I'll revert to you in one moment. I just need to uh, quickly ask uh, Dr. Sandra Rose Michael um, to please give her uh, two or three minute overview of the status quo before I revert back. Well, I, I think what uh, one of the pieces that needs addressed um, with our, our chief and, and Africa is that this is rather related to what happened probably with the AIDS and, and the HIV vaccines before. There is a component that is um, we'll call recombinant or spliced in. This is a, a bat coronavirus 
um, but it's also uh, it's, it's recombinant. It does not incur, occur in nature. So this was a lab created um, virus. And the patents uh, have been issued to Pure Bright Institute, which is owned by Gates Foundation. So that I think is some of the, the background information for, for that piece. Thank you, thank you, uh, Commissioner Sander. I, uh, curiously enough, uh, Bill Gates appears to be being uh, roasted in the most unholy way at the moment on social media, on his own social media profile. Uh, we understand that many, many thousands of uh, posts have been removed in the last few hours alone. Uh, Dr. Joe, I'm gonna refer this to you, uh, please. And then I'd also like to um, uh, refer to Dr. John Martin, and then we'll get back to Robert David Steele. Dr. Joe, please address the issue. Yes, I need to address this Perbram um, patent because this was um, known pretty much early on when I got information about the decoding of the virus. Um, you know, I worked in virology during the times of the first SARS epidemic. So it was very interesting that I got it by the local news on the 21st of January, and it was actually like the little brother of SARS, um, and it's a, a better coronavirus. So it's not related to that Perbram Institute coronavirus because it's a gamma retrovirus. So it's really into virology right now and, and, and um, relations in family and genetics. But it's like um, the WHO refused to rename it to SARS-2. Um, it was actually the virology, um, um, like uh, societies that decided to name that virus uh, SARS-CoV-2, but the WHO decided on saying coronavirus, and it's the whole big family. So you get the confusion with the human coronaviruses and the actual SARS-like virus that we have. And I would agree to, with uh, Dr. Sandra Michael um, that it, uh, for me, it looks like a lab stemming virus because there was this gain of function um, studies going on and actually the SARS virus got patented that was isolated from humans, supposedly. That's what, what was patented. But I actually also know about an independent journalist from Bulgaria who found out about a laboratory where under this disguise of uh, diplomacy and diplomatic papers pathogens were traveled into and there was research done and it was actually on the same like um, where I did my doctor thesis on on the same viruses um, that they did clinical trials and um, it was on therapy and not, it was not on uh, vaccines like in Africa like the report of uh, the chief um, but it was without any responsibility by this um, medical, uh, not medical, by this pharma company, Gilead, <laughs> who is now presenting the, uh, we took, um, the, this antiviral, this new thing that I've heard not so many good stories about. But it's like in, in this whole pandemic discussion, for me, it is a real virus. I know about the... Um, 5G problem, and for me, it's also a big problem, but it's adding up to each other from my, in my perspective. And um, I want to add that there's there are so many different layers, and also the, the exosome theory is really important for me because it's true, we can see these exosomes, but there are also many viruses that are kind of ignored, especially in the viruses, uh, in the in the vaccines because all our laboratory cells are contaminated <laughs> with uh, viruses that can cause human pathology. So it was a big uh, scientific and political attack and I have checked on the science and I can tell about that. So I have um, this experience from front lines um, talking to people who are in fear of having COVID or like we say, being positive SARS too, because you don't have COVID if, if you're positively tested. That's that's a misjudgment. But some get worse, and and I hear I talk to them as well. So 
Um, but I also see these measurements that are taken and I have a child and she's not allowed to go on the um, playground and play with other kids and that's really hard. So we need to really be careful. But from my perspective, I think it was necessary, but you know, in treating diseases, you always look, is there a cure? And if it's the terrain that needs to be cleaned and needs to be healthy, then it's necessary to address that. And if it's a germ that is affecting the immune system, it needs to be addressed as well. And if there's a, a short-term therapy, it's like, you know, a colleague of mine got infected with leprosy. People were put out of the towns because of leprosy. Now we have antibiotics and it was a tough cure, but he worked after that. And, you know, I'm not afraid of viruses. I can, um, I operated people with viruses, multiple viruses. And so it's, but I, need, I think it's actually a weaponization of germs and the information campaigns that are going uh, against 5G and the additional problem to the viral disease, the, the smog and the toxicity and all that. It's not non, non unicausal these problems. And that's, yeah. I think, why we see the different numbers also from my country. And just so you know, we do autopsy on the COVID patients. So there are different um, results, but none of them was without any precondition, but who knows who has preconditions. That's the different thing. I, for myself, think um, I pretty know uh, much that I, that I am vaccine injured. So <laughs> I'm pretty um, comfortable with everybody not putting me into the panic side when I want to have to distance, you know, that's the other side. The other side of um, feeling kind of secure, but I don't want to have that lasting any longer. And the measurements remind me of history, sad history of my country that I have, that I had the feeling I have to speak up because we don't, we are not in lockdown like many of you are. We have that distant social distancing, uh, distancing advices, and in some areas we have curfews. But that's kind of just where the epicenter of an epidemic is. An outbreak. Thank so. you, thank you very much, Dr. Joe. Dr. Martin, would you care to comment uh, on this? Yeah, I'd like to comment, and also like to take a more positive view of how to approach this as well as other infections. The essential uh, research that is now coming into enormous relevance. Years ago, we noted that there were viruses which could cause cell damage in cultures, could give illnesses in animals, and yet did not engage the immune system. So I now put immunity to one side, and what you were saying about more the terrain effect, the ability of cells to resist virus on the other side. What cells need to function is cellular energy. We realize that food metabolism provides calories and energy in that uh, pathway, but the body uses a lot more energy than provided by food. We therefore describe an alternative cellular energy pathway another way in which the body can get energy. That energy is reflected in a dynamic or kinetic activity in the body's fluids. We see it in terms of its effects in water as a loosening of the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. And the water will also let go of some of the elect electrolytes like chloride ions, um, in the fluid, which can then be beneficial to the humans. So what we now know, the body has this alternative cellular energy pathway, which can provide protection against viruses. Identified at first because they could protect against these self-adapted viruses, but the same pathway can help eliminate herpes infections, using activated water preparations, sometimes thought of as homeopathy, they can, there are data 
good published data in eliminating HIV, herpes simplex, uh, papillomavirus. So there is a clear uh, pathway to protect individuals against infections using the energy that can be transferred to activated water. What we also realize now that that energy is obtained from the environment. And as you mentioned earlier, I refer to it as KELEA, K-E-L-E-A, kinetic energy limiting electrostatic attraction. The fundamental purpose of this energy is probably, and I say probably, that it is necessary when you have positive and negative electrical charges, they are attracted to each other. That attraction gets stronger and stronger the closer they get, and yet there's no fusion and there's no annihilation. There's a repelling force at the end. So we call it this energy that limits that electrostatic attraction. But in water, it loosens the water molecules, makes them a form of chemical. In fact, it is indeed what chemists have been struggling with, what is chemical energy. And as if one is talking to a basic chemist, ask the basic question, what is chemical energy? They will say it's the energy you can derive from that compound during combustion. If you heat it up, you'll get heat out. And they say, no, not that one. What is the energy when you have linked chemical reactions? A gives B product, and that releases some energy, allowing C to go to D product. There was never a good explanation of that. This clear um, concept ties in with that chemical energy. What makes it then um, uh, relevant is that it can be put into water, or we now have a nice location in Southern California where from a deep well, the water coming out of the ground is naturally activated. That energy in the water is transmissible to nearby water. You can either add regular water to it and it will become activated, or you can place it nearby to other water and that uh, regular water then becomes activated. The science is even more interesting. You can use that water to activate gasoline just by having it in close proximity and getting better gas mileage. But this has allowed the placement of that water into what we're calling water cyclical pouches. And they're being sent to various individuals, not yet in a rigorous clinical trial, but what's encouraging is horse trainers are finding the same benefits of those water cyclical pouches when they're treating horses post-exercise and illness. So the message that I wanted to convey through this group and other groups is to not simply look at the coronavirus outbreak in terms of flattening the curve, which is where the theme is at the moment, and make it slower, but still the same number of people under either the steep curve or the flattened curve, rather make people more resilient to infections using this concept of an alternative cellular energy pathway People can activate their own energy pathway through the processes in the brain, or if they need it, in terms of water. And to move beyond this coronavirus pandemic, to realize that as a result of um, vaccines, there has been a pandemic of stealth-adapted viruses that have impacted humanity in a very big way, but also into animals. And if there's one other uh, concept relevant to this group, the idea of Kalia being a natural force bound by separated electrical charges allows for it to be entering the earth in conjunction with cosmic rays. So we have protons, electrons uh, coming into the earth atmosphere continually with uh, cosmic rays. We've got data and experiments showing that 
electromagnetic radiation, which also creates separated charges, can capture some of that Kalia coming into the Earth. I don't think it's only 5G. I think the enormous million-fold increase in electromagnetic radiation in the upper atmosphere has resulted in less of this Kalia coming to uh, the Earth that all life forms, not only humans, animals, and plants, get energy beyond food metabolism from this Kalia as an alternative cellular energy pathway, and that the electromagnetic radiation, by diminishing the availability of Kalia to life forms, has had an impact. So what we're, yes, I, I, I'll leave it at that. At some stage though, I'd like to give a small comment about stealth adapted viruses because having those on board probably is impeding people's defense mechanisms, making them more susceptible to coronaviruses as well as other infections. Thank you. To Joe, you put your hand up. Did you want to speak to something there very, very briefly? Okay. I wanted to add that um, I'm very familiar with what, with what uh, John Martin um, said. I'm actually trained in something that is a history of 40 years um, with all these electromagnetic frequency interferences with the human body um, immune system um, and um, the work of, for, for instance, Cyril Smith on that is really impressive on electromagnetic um, um, sensitivity, for instance, it was in in the eighties, so it's it's like a long-standing um, scientific body. Um, and um, in the latest times, um, Professor Montagnier, um, who actually got the Nobel Prize for discovery of HIV, um, in contrast to Gallo, there was kind of a little fight who did um, who sequenced this HIV first. But he's actually doing research right now on. Um, on this water memory issue and it's, it's explaining that with uh, quantum theory and all that so i have dig deeply into that and what's concerning me with the 5g issue is that actually montagnier has shown with uh, german groups that you can induce a what viral sequence into a tissue culture just by electromagnetic uh, induction so it's like um, this is the paper for it on it. I don't know if you can see it. This is one of his papers on the transduction of DNA, and they did kind of the same with a um, genome sequence where they they digitalized it, sent it via mail, and then got the resonance frequency set into a PCR machine, and then could reproduce the genome like sending a genome pep via mail. So it's like, there's so much truth beneath what we think is known. So I think it's really, it has to be an effort of multiple different disciplines to take is, all these concerns serious. Because for sure, if the oxygen is affected and, and you get a, a typical pneumonia, which this one is, where you get a swelling from in the tissues, then the exchange of oxygen is, is impaired as well. And it would add up to each other. Like, but thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate that looking yes. into the different things. But I think these viruses could also be these um, problematic viruses that contaminate the vaccines since the 1930s. Um, when they started to do the research on it. So it's multiple generations of us and they are shown it's retrovirus so they can integrate into our DNA and we can pass it to our child. So that's where the susceptibility, susceptibility um, for the little ones rises if a mom that's heavily vaccinated is giving these viruses to their child and then they are getting their first shots and it's in their system that you get reactivation of these viruses Indeed. that have integrated into the, the DNA. Thank, thank you, Dr. Joe. I'm going to have to move on. I'm sorry. Uh, Robert Steele, uh, a good time for you to interject. I want to make several brief comments and I'll give them very short pauses because they're honoring different people. Uh, first, in honor of the chief, 
Bill Gates is under Supreme Court trial in India for testing vaccines that have caused cancer and murdered many children across India. I believe that the time has come for all countries, starting with Africa, African countries and India, to bring Bill Gates to trial everywhere. It's the end of the first comment. Second comment, honoring our anonymous contributor. And I can send this slide to you, uh, Sasha, but there is essentially a real problem in that the president and uh, others received false information and it was also partial information. There's a very famous video that was banned on YouTube by Dr. Cohen, which talks about when a whole bunch of dolphins get sick, do you go in and start doing genetic testing or do you ask if someone has put a whole bunch of shit in the water? The environment really matters. And we have been killing ourselves with bad air, bad food, bad water, fluoride in the water, and so forth. This may be an excellent wake up moment. And last but not least, and this is not really something you wanna show on screen, but I will make the comment that not only myself, but so many others, including Dr. Ron Paul, Dr. Shiva in Massachusetts, many contrarians came out immediately challenging the official narrative. And what was the reaction? Although I wasn't banned from YouTube, I was demonetized. And many others have been censored from Twitter, from Facebook, and so forth. So in many ways, this virus 5G uh, environmental issue is really almost the perfect storm to review. At what point do we demand the truth at any cost? So I'm very happy to be part of this. And I think that it really is essential that, that this commission build on the chief's comments and call for international legal action against the Gates Foundation and against all governments that have been in collaboration with the Gates Foundation against their very own people. Thank, thank you, Robert. Of course, in speaking about the Gates Foundation, uh, it, it leads directly, as we well know, to the WHO and the CDC. And the big problem uh, that we've got, and, and this planetary um, uh, pantomime or hysteria is testament to the fact that the problem we've got is the multilateral institutional stranglehold on all of the governments, all of the technocracies and bureaucracies, they've all been set up like a dominoes over generations so that you simply pop in uh, something into the World Health Organization and it sets off a chain reaction through all of the attendant ministries around the world, all of the compact signatories to the UN Charter are forced into compliance with protocols. And the next thing you know, uh, compounded with artificial intelligence algorithms by best accounts, you find that in the farthest flung regions of the world, uh, they're clicking their heels to these protocols and vaccinations are rolling out and draconian uh, uh, measures are being taken as far afield as places like where I'm calling you from, the Southeast Asian jungles. Thomas uh, J. Brown, as a trustee of the ITNJ, as a science researcher, and a fellow of the New Earth University, please uh, do give us a three or four minute overview of the status as you see it, and then please feel free to ask questions of our professionals. Thank you. Well, certainly, no, thank you. And um, I'm really appreciating what I'm hearing here. Get this out. And one thing I would like to say as, as trustee of the ITNJ, right, that everybody speaking here is speaking of their own individual opinions, right? We, we aren't um, here as a collective group putting these ideas out. And I just want to make that clear because of, you know, I think we're going to be getting more scrutiny from international press. So this is a discussion forum where everybody is here to give their professional and uh, experiential knowledge and opinions on these ideas. So having said that, I'm going to take that hat off and speak as a fellow and science director at New Earth University. And in that, right, we've discussed here like the uh, virus versus exosome theory. I just want to briefly touch on a couple of things. I'll make it quick here. I was looking at one paper here, conserved and host specific features of influenza variant architecture. Variants of, of many viruses are complex and pleomorphic, making them difficult to analyze in detail. 
and influenza virions therefore resemble exosomes both in their hydrodynamic properties and in their protein composition. So we know there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of um, science that is actually left out of modern science, you know, going back to Bichamp and Underline, even in more modern times, uh, Gaston Nason's work with the somatids, these tiny bodies. Uh, and then, of course, the electrical side. I'm familiar with uh, Luc Montagnier's work, was fortunate to meet him last year in Frankfurt at the International Water Conference. So we know that there's some unsettled science in this region. Um, now, the testing is very variable. There's a lot of people saying the testing is completely unreliable, but yet then I find a paper, they have Koch's postulates fulfilled for SARS virus that, um, so apparently that's been gone through. But then if I look at the, uh, let's say the uh, rapid regulatory status, here's from, uh, for research use only, this is from uh, makers of the test, SARS cov 2 coronavirus multiplex RT qPCR kit. So this is from the instructions of the kit. The New York SARS-CoV-2 real-time PT-PCR diagnostic panel has been designated to minimize the likelihood of false positive test results. However, in the event of false positive result, risk to patients could include the following, et cetera. They're basically admitting that these tests are unreliable. So this is a question, uh, you know, maybe uh, Dr. Joe or John Martin can address at some point is, you know, okay, it, it's a question of the proteins are similar, um, there's a real mix on this. We have people like um, Dr. Andy Kaufman, uh, Tom Cohen's been out there saying, well, Rudolf Steiner said that, you know, viruses are the excretion of cells. Now the anthroposoph anthroposophical doctors are up in arms because they're saying, well, Steiner never said that and he didn't. Um, but you have people quoting Steiner incorrectly and there's this whole sort of mix up in this field around there. So I'd love to, we really need to get more clarity. Moving on from there, we know infection rates are massively exaggerated. We got uh, Professor John I I I I I I from Stanford. Um, so I've got a list of these people. Professor uh, Goch, official numbers wildly exaggerated. So we're having a lot of um, top medical people are saying this is wrong. We've got uh, people like this uh, Dr. Cameron Kyle Sedell, who is a, a emergency doctor in New York City, and he's saying that this stuff is. It's defying common sense, the uh, symptoms. They're not like regular pneumonia. It's more like people are taken from sea level to the top of Mount Everest instantly, and they're struggling for oxygen. And this may have something to do with electrodynamic action. Some people are attributing this to 5G, which you know, could be from the area. We've got Senator Dr. Scott Jensen from Minnesota. He's a state senator and a doctor, and he's saying the CDC is intentionally telling them to defraud, basically commit fraud and put um, COVID uh, 19 on the death certificates. And we've also have Montana physician, Dr. Ann Bukacek, who has been signing death certificates for 30 years, and she's a whistleblowing the same thing, saying, look, we're committing, they're, you know, they're committing fraud on the numbers here. And um, so to the virus itself, right, uh, there's a documentary going around now, The uh, True Origins of the uh, Wuhan Virus by Epoch Times, which is the following Gong Group, which actually has come under a lot of fire in China, organ harvesting, we know about a lot of that. But we also know they've got connections to intelligence, uh, Western intelligence. So in there, they're basically claiming that this whole thing has come out of Chinese weapons labs. And they're showing you know, the relationships. And actually, it's quite detailed and very interesting. They brush over briefly the connection of um, a Harvard professor, chemistry professor, who was um, arrested, uh, who was uh, Charles Lieber. So I started looking into him, and of course, now Gates, Gates is a member of the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's been inducted in there, his connections to the Wuhan lab. Uh, we know that Gates and uh, Epstein were both involved in funding at Harvard. Uh, Epstein actually stating he was very interested in viruses. Lieber's research, curiously enough, is based on making virus-sized transistors for injection into the systems. So I think that there's a much bigger picture around all that. And uh, you know, we know with you know, Fauci is tied in, so we can tie in Gates and Fauci to multi-generational um, eugenicist programs, which involve all these vaccinations around the world. And uh, 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 Chief Sylvester, it actually hurts to hear what you're saying 
about what's happening there in Africa. I really appreciate your report. That's the first I had heard that, and I really hope you keep us informed on that. I think our best uh, enforcement um, procedure we have right now is getting good information out to the public and, and keeping this as focused as we can on this. And, and basically, then the global lockdown, which we know the crackdown on human rights, if all this other uh, material is happening with very, uh, you know, still unsettled science, questions on the um, testing, you know, obviously people manipulating behind the scenes. Um, what's really behind this lockdown? Um, yeah, that's my sort of overview. I'm sort of swimming in so much data. I'm a bit lost and daunted by it. And um, thank, just thank you, happy Tom. to be able to put some information in here. Thank you, Tom, very much indeed. Uh, Paula uh, Woodley, um, you're a veteran uh, in the healthcare um, industry. And I know that you're just about to head off to, uh, to New York to join the uh, US Navy ships, hospital ships, Comfort uh, and, and Mercy. Um, do, you, do you wish to say anything at this time? You've pr you heard a lot of criticism here. Um, I'm a former Director General of the United Nations in the IGO sector. I've got some experience um, in, in, in the problems of globalism as it relates to the UN. You're a former UN nurse. I mean, a question to you is, are you also, have you been frustrated in the past by, um, by the systems, the systems in place? Yes, I don't even know where to begin, but first of all, I have to say, Sasha, I dealt with um, all different types of infectious diseases and Ebola, I was on part of the research which with, you know, was the H1N1. I have never seen with some of the diseases that I have experienced in 40 years of my career that we have had a, um, a lockdown of the economy, which is something that really does surprise me, is that it had to come to that. Um, secondly, I have some concerns about the semantics and the media and the term that is called the vac I mean, a virus even in, in essence, or even referring to the vaccines like I, I want to get into right now with, is that we're looking at this, the media, as, of course, as you know, is taking a spin on this. This is something that I believe that, um, who is a very um, person that I admire is Dr. Jane Goodall. She made a video this morning that said that we made this virus, okay? We made this virus, and as a humanitarian, I think it's saddening to see what I have experienced. And I, I mean, I've had a grandmother from Finland who uh, experienced or was aware of the Spanish flu, as you know, the Great Depression. And this is something that is, it's, it's almost like a, a repeat of history to a certain degree. What we have here is beyond chaos. We have a, a, a uh, terminology that we're using for a virus yet again it's from mammals to humans and first of all we're not even addressing because as a nurse my whole emphasis I work with Deepak Chopra I'm a certified instructor with him we need to be looking at this whole this as a whole picture we need to be looking at how this is impacting everyone's lives we're not even talking like if I watch the news I'm saying to myself I need to be aware of what's happening I'm exhausted watching it but I never learn anything from it. Like I'm saying to myself, why are not we talking about nutrition, our immunity, and why are we arguing about IV vitamin C, which actually saved my mother's life, which is another chapter. But this is something now we're putting an FDA stamp on saying that we won't let integrative medicine doctors do it. But at the same time, we're finding out the numbers are going down in China as a result of this. So why are, is the media, taking a spin on blaming a political football here and not dealing with things that we need to be focused on. What we can, toilet tissue is not a priority. Hand sanitizer is not a priority. We need to be talking about nutrition, how to increase our immunity. And nutrition is not alternative medicine. And how it got to that point, I went to Alverno College, which was one of the top 10 universities a parochial school, the nuns of St. Francis, that we talked about nutrition as part of health and healing. It wasn't a, an argument between conventional and integrative medicine. Nutrition is the foundation of our health, our digestion, and we need to be focusing on Dr. Sandra Rose knows, you know, vitamin D3, silver, all of these things that we could put this now and nip it in the butt before it even has gotten to this point. Because social isolation is just a reminder of what has happened. And our coach, she talked about the, on your other case that you had, was with snowing. 
Now, snowing, I, I just wanted to share this with um, you folks. Snowing, actually, I don't know if you can see this, but snowing, I'd like to define that. The Department of Justice has done an investigation on the term snowing. Snowing is when you take a group of elderly population and what you do is you intubate them and then you also give them opiates. And I think Mr. Steele had uh, addressed that at one point. And what that is about is that you make them to the point that um, they, they cannot speak for themselves and then they become in, incapacitated, incompetent, and then you appoint them a guardian. So now what happens in that case? What are we doing? We're dealing with ventilators and opiates and guardianship. We're stripping them of their, their rights and they're isolated and we're dealing with opiates and we're dealing with ventilation, ventilators. Now my concern is this, the semantics that we're using here has also been deceiving the public. This is not, a, when I talk to the majority of the people that I know, they think a ventilator is oxygen. A ventilator is, life support okay it's life support where it means that you will be having a tube and i'm also an instructor with ASHI, the american health institute we usually intubate when somebody does not have an open airway okay somebody who basically there's abcs you look at their airway their breathing and their circulation it's the last resort that you really want to do so what we generally would say is that if you were to um give do life support this is something where you need to have an attorney involved, family involved, and this is end of life decisions, okay? So we're using the term ventilator without getting into the point that this is actually life support. And we're getting into opiates. We're also having a deficiency, or not a deficiency, but we're looking at, um, we, uh, there's a lack of supply of opiates, fentanyl and profanol. These are the two opiates that you give when you, when you intubate somebody. It's a very uncomfortable process. But the, pro the other consequences are most of these people that are intubated lose their vocal cord function, their swallowing function, and this gets the money machine going. The money machine will be basically this $950,000 procedure. You're going to have to be tube fed. You're going to have to have catheters, and it's a domino effect. So also then what we, we're dealing with is um, with guardianship, with this, you know, basically in the past has been ad addressed with snowing, is that then they're isolated, and then... We, they die, and of course, then you get involved with APS where they separate the families. Now, with APS involved with, as we know, the guardianships in this country, which is another topic altogether, this is almost history repeating itself. This is almost like a complete mass of snowing, and it's to that extreme because we have ventilators, we have opiates, we have isolation, and we have death, but we're also dealing with a death that is, is, is terrifying because folks are losing their family, they're losing their loved ones, and they're saying goodbye to them on Zoom. And I mean, and I have to say at one point, I have, I'm very emotional about this because this is how I have lost my mother. And I don't think there's anything worse than losing your loved one and not being able to hug them or to even see them. So, but right now, there is a standard of care in this country, which I would like Dr. Rose perhaps to address, and every day, um, nurses are looking at, they go to work, of course, they don't have their PPE, which is their protective personal equipment. But the thing is, is that standard of care is changing continuously. Uh, they're arguing about hydroxychloroquine. They're arguing about um, basically, and that's a very reasonable drug, which we know is working. But again, that's something that's worked for parasites. Then you're dealing with z pack which is an antibiotic, which is like a broad spectrum that deals with gram-negative. So, you know, I've talked to doctors too, and nobody's talking about what is really in this virus. Is this a disease? Is this a gram negative, Klebsiella, E. coli? Is it uh, HIV? I've heard all kinds of things with Ebola, but nobody seems to be getting to the root of the problem of what is in this, because then if we can isolate it, and how is this spreading? This is another real concern. Being a nurse, is this through chemtrails, which everybody wants to debunk and call it? conspiracy theory. My husband was from Saudi Arabia who passed away years ago, but I do have to say we have people in other countries that, that are wondering, are, is this being contaminated through drones or, or is this basically chemtrails? These are not conspiracy theories. These are things that need to be looked into. We also need to look at a virus, I mean the vaccine. A vaccine is a long-term basic treatment for it. That's not something that we should even be talking about yet. It's going to take years. 
when you look at a vaccine, it is basically an antigen antibody reaction that it's what it's about. You're giving somebody the antigen of something that they may or may not acquire and then your body's gonna build antibodies. Now, is our body scientifically going to develop an antibody for something that came from a mammal? Is that something that's even realistic to think? And do we even know what is in this perhaps strain? You know, I think that at this point, it doesn't matter where it came from or how it got started. It's a man-made virus or disease or however you want to call it. This is important, but we can't cast blame and play politics here. We do have a commander in chief and this is our leader, but all we watch on TV is the media more or less attacking our leader. And then we, we get viewpoints and people are arguing. As a nurse, what I would like to see is that, and this is my focus, let's talk about how we can protect ourselves right now, not hand sanitizers and, and toilet tissue, foods that we need to eat. Um, also, there's so much nutrition out there that we should be including in our diet. Stress, we need to be having meditation and people coming into the homes or, or something on TV live streaming to tell people that, um, like Deepak will emphasize over and over as a, an instructor myself, when you get stressed, what happens to your body? A cortisol is released from your adrenal glands. That does what? That suppresses your immunity so you are going to get sick. So we have a whole spectrum here of things that I could talk about for an, over an hour, but it's frustrating me because I would love to see, and I don't want to see things debunked with nutrition, because nutrition is what our first line of defense is. And I know that vitamin C works in high doses, and I have a library full of books how they have debunked high doses of A, which is something our body needs. They have debunked D3, which is vitamins that we need. Cod liver oil, I take cod liver oil every day of my life. And I'm fortunate, almost 65 years old, that I thank God I'm healthy. But I know the difference between what's scientific and what is also things that are not. And I know that I've seen a lot in my career and in throughout my life. And if I could do anything to help people, I do not think that social isolation, taking away the economy and not knowing for sure how this is spread, and having people who are actually, we've, I've had a patient come into the office and she was bleaching everything and she thought that she needed to. She actually got more sick, Sasha, from the bleach and inhaling it where it burnt her lungs. So we need to have a, somebody, it's, it's like we need to have education out there from a perspective of what we can do now short term, talk about vaccines and the future, of course, but also we need to have, we don't need to be watching every day the media attacking the commander in chief. We need to be having people talk about what it is that we can do and how we can come together and whether or not this happened for a purpose. Um, I, I, I have to say, I believe that there is a hidden agenda. I had a father who was very wise, who taught me about certain things in life, about the new world order. And am I afraid to talk about this to some people? Well, yes, I am. But I, I chose in life that I have my beliefs, that I know what I believe, and I can see what's true. So I believe if we come up with the truth, we work together and we stop debunking things that are actually correct. Because right now, what I see that we're doing is that we are destroying things that we could be doing that's going to help us with this disease or virus or whatever you want to call it. But again, like I said, there is a hybrid in here. I know that there's factors with Charles Lieber, which I read about. I read about the bats. I read about all of these things. But to uh, for our technology nowadays, you know, this, is, this should not be an argument about how this got started. This should be clear. This should be very transparent. And somehow with all of this conspiracy theories makes people wonder, really what is the secret why do we have to be why is this a guessing game so again i don't mean to get into my frustrations but i would like also for dr sandra to discuss how their standard of care is set in this country so that we can get an idea as to why there's a lot of mass confusion here thank you very much indeed and i, I very much appreciate the fact that um, you, you've spoken about seminal things that, that the layman is going to understand and agree with across the board. Nutrition. I even saw Robert nodding his head there. Nutrition is the key thing. I mean, I have to say the scurrilous uh, report against the International Tribunal um, that came out yesterday in the United Kingdom, RAG, um, 
was was having a, a go at one of the commissioners of the ITNJ, Dawn Alexander, uh, world famous for what she's accomplished um, in natural health, and 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 she was clubbed together, you know, as a conspiracy theorist because she's cited in the British Library as being one of the hundred most influential and important people of color in British history. The woman carries an MBE from the Queen of England, and she's a commissioner of the ITNJ. And some banal character, um, a jockey reporter, is, uh, is libeling her as being a conspiracy theorist because she's saying that natural health and natural health care is the source code of getting away from viruses and all of this transhumanist nonsense that seems to be unfurling. I'm also very grateful and salute you, Paula, uh, for speaking against the, the systems which prevail because it is... Uh, government. It is big government. It is overreaching government. It's the multilateral sector as well that have got in the face of humankind and need to now step aside or they will be torn down and set ablaze. That will absolutely happen. And we all know it. Anyone with a pulse does. Dr. Sandra Michael, before I rever refer back to um, Robert and then to Alfred and Seven, I'd just like to invite you, uh, Dr. Sandra Michael, Commissioner Michael, please give us your three, four minute overview and, uh, and possibly answer uh, to some of what Paula raised, which was another vital element, which is the asset stripping that is going on, arguably with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of victims of the system who are being coroned and having uh, the guardian state step in and, uh, and take over their estates. That is a very real issue. And uh, we need to look at that because that's a trillion dollar or a multi-billion dollar financial harvesting element to what might be going on. So please, uh, Dr. Sandra Rose Michael. Okay, of course, you know, I, I do like to start also, not just the nutrition, it's, it's all about the terrain. And that's where we need to start, the terrain. And, and our terrain, our bioterrains have been compromised. We're living in a toxic soup between the EMF, the ELF, the radiation, the electrosmog of that, and the controversy over 5G, which really should not be that much of a controversy as far as, you know, one paper, September 13th, 2017, was 100, 180 scientists from 35 countries recognizing uh, you know, the uh, symptoms of 5G, the hypersensitivity, but the Alzheimer's cancer being related and their concerns about flu-like symptoms. And this was, this was a study from 2017, flu-like symptoms. So some of the symptoms of the radiation, which doctors are not trained to recognize or look at, the issues of radiation poisoning, and the 5G has specific frequencies with the 60, mega, um, 60 uh, megahertz uh, millimeter waves, which interferes with the oxygen uptake in the hemoglobin. And so that is part of what we're seeing with this, uh, that with this virus, is the body is not uptaking the oxygen. And so part of what uh, she was talking about is standard of care when somebody goes in with uh, the symptoms of COVID-19, it's SARS-2. It's, um, you know, we've got a weaponized version where they took S proteins and to make that human-to-human uh, -human transmission, and it's spliced. Everybody, anybody that's looked at the research knows that this, is a, this was lab-created. It was lab recombinant. Uh, and created to be very uh, virulent as far as to spread very easily. Um, so there, you know, that gain of function studies that they actually did on this virus, and that's admitted. Uh, so, and it was uh, released out of Wuhan, somewhere where there's that stage four lab. Uh, and I want to mention some of the background with that. The labs there is, um, that's, very connected to the World Health Organization, which you know the connection with Gates, but evidently Soros was a major funder of that lab. And so this has been a long time agenda. And you can look at uh, UN, you know, the UN agendas, depopulation agendas, the eugenicists, which there's a long history of, of that agenda being 
promulgated through Gates, etc. Um, so there's there's those aspects. So when somebody presents at a at a doctor or a facility with SARS-like symptoms or this COVID flu symptoms, you know, there's the shortness of breath, which is is part of it uh, because of that oxygen uptake being interfered with. And I did read the studies of how this virus actually interferes with that oxygen uptake in the body. And it's very different uh, than using ventilators. So, I, so the second reign is there's a lot of research now. I mean, a lot of research. Two studies from France, the latest one from Dr. Raoul is over a thousand patients. You have Dr. Zelenko, in uh, New York, um, it's close, 900 patients the last I checked on his studies, having tremendous results with this combination of hydroxychloroquine, uh, the azithromycin, and zinc. And hydroxychloroquine has been in use more than 70 years as an anti-malarial. Yes, the antiviral effects of hydroxychloroquine, but it's also a channel that gets the zinc into the cells. So again, we're back to nutrition, in a sense, this is a nutrient, zinc in the cell stops the replication and the attachment of the virus in, into the cells. And so it's reducing the viral load very, very quickly. Doctor, a doctor in California came out and said, even people with severe, severe symptoms when they're presenting, they're coming out and, you know, and being basically rather symptom free in approximately eight hours. Dr. Zelenko talked about people could breathe again from that shortness of breath in three to four hours with this combination protocol of uh, hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin with the zinc. And then they've also added vitamin C to that and vitamin D. Everybody knows that vitamin D is, is very, very important for preventing the flu. And this is something everybody should be doing. So I get very concerned when they want people to stay inside when they need the vitamin D and just being outside will prevent most of it. And, you know, so uh, for most people, the symptoms are very mild unless they've taken Advil. <laughs> They're finding a real connection with the Advil, Advil and, and some of the other things. So it was like it was designed almost for it to affect people because people will go pull an Advil or ibuprofen out of their medicine kit at the first sign of a headache, which is one of the first signs. And then that's part of the setup that where those are the people having more severe uh, incidents there. So that's one of the problems. I've, I've also been on with Dr. Victor Marcial Vega, who is a signatory and part of that um, Shanghai official government recommendations um, for high dose vitamin C, both through orally and IVs. What is very, what he, Dr. Victor Marcel Vega is very excited about is he was fast-tracked through NIH to actually get that study done. That happened this last week, in less than 24-hour approval. He has, of course, he's very highly credentialed, top 1% of credentials, the MDs, John Hopkins trained oncologist, but he's been working with the high-dose vitamin C protocols for over 20 years. And so that is now an official study. And that's what was primarily used in China uh, is the high dose vitamin C IVs and orally, which also is another thing that stops it. What's happening in the US is their standard protocol of somebody presenting, not being able to breathe, not and with the hypoxia, the oxygen levels falling, they've been trained to put people into these ventilators and you had everybody demanding these ventilators. We need more ventilators. What they're actually finding now is 80% of the people being put on those ventilators are dying because they're being put into a, a, a coma essentially from the propanol and fentanyl to be able to intubate them. And they're dying alone without their family. And, and, and this is a, a total travesty. But they actually found that it's making it worse. It's uh, because you wouldn't have that many dying on the ventilators. But it's, it's very contraindicated with the way this particular virus. It's not the typical, um, it, it, it's, it's very atypical in how that presents. But again, standard of care was intubation. And in the meantime, I, I know um, Paula found the research of how much money 
uh, um, the company, companies producing ventilators has gone up. But ventilators should be a last resort. When you have something that, you know, what Dr. Zelenko found is in the first three to four hours of hydroxychloroquine, zith azithromycin, it's a, and the zinc, it's a $12 approximately cost, can't be patented, and it's people can breathe in three to four hours. It's a five day protocol essentially, and 98% of people, this is highly effective. Uh, and, and this is what the studies are backing up. There's like six different studies internationally, you've got New York and California. So this should be one of the first things done. And then if that doesn't work, let's go to the high dose vitamin C IVs and, and protocols like that. And then there are alternative cellular pathways, of course, <laughs> as John Martin talked about, because we've got to have the energy for our bodies to heal. And that's part of you know, the biophysics of it that we work with. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Everything. Sandra Marco. Th thank. Have you have you have you, complete, have you finished there, Sandra? Um, is there anything else you wanted me to address right now? Well, we'll we'll come back to it. But I just very briefly want uh, Robert Steele to speak to uh, counterintelligence uh, as it relates uh, to to the status to the status quo right now. Thank you, Sasha. Um, members of the commission, I hope I'm the only intelligence officer in this group. Uh, perhaps others of you uh, have roles to play. Um, when I first wrote the first article, I said it was a counterintelligence challenge. And the reason I said it was a counterintelligence challenge was because I knew immediately that this was a bioengineered virus. I don't believe it came out of the Wuhan facility. I believe it came out of George Sotis's separate facility or the military members from NATO Gladio. And furthermore, I believe that the Jewish professor at Harvard is the Lee Harvey Oswald of this whole event. He was meant to be discovered. Uh, and this was an attempt to blame the Chinese for what is in fact a deep state, Bill Gates, uh, Rockefeller, NATO initiative. Bill Binney and I have been talking about this. Bill is the former senior executive from the National Security Agency. Bill and I are intimately familiar with everything we have, which is to say, every email, every cell call, every text, every Instagram, every Tinder, all of us. The good news is NSA doesn't process that stuff until you become prime minister. Then they have it all. Um, there are three counterintelligence studies that need to be done. The first is everyone who has ever talked to Bill Gates, period. <laughs> Second, is all of the insider trading because Bill Gates briefed this in Switzerland in early January and massive amounts of insider trading took place. That's the second counterintelligence study that needs to be done. And the third counterintelligence study is the media. It is no accident that the media has wrecked the global economy. It's not this alleged virus, which I first called the fake pandemic that has wrecked the economy, it's the media. The media was orchestrated by CIA, by MI6, by the central banks and by others. So there are three counterintelligence studies that have to take place. And the reason they have to take place is because the next pandemic will be real. And if we don't stop it, I, I said in a communication to the White House, you cannot win a pandemic. You have to find and kill the people planning the pandemic before they do it. So from where I sit, a counterintelligence study is absolutely essential. Thank you, uh, thank you, Robert David Steele. Um, we've uh, one and a half hours into this hearing, so we've got about a half an hour uh, left. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'll be uh, probably jumping in if answers are longer than about two minutes, respectfully uh, to all of you, especially to our visiting experts to whom we are incredibly grateful that you're lending your names and in some cases, most cases, your faces as well. Um, what I'd like to do is to ask uh, Thomas Brown, do you have any particular questions for the experts on this panel? Probably a lot of them. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in the um, you know, potential electrodynamic nature of the viruses, you know, what's happening. Um, and even just to find out, you know, just what their position is on the terrain theory versus germ theory, right? Because as I was pointing out in, um, in my earlier discussion, the science is truly unsettled on this. So um, I'm agreeing with uh, Robert Steele, you know, on his counterintelligence sort of 
view of this and you know Libra being potentially the Lee Harvey Oswald of it. So as far as questions, I, I just really would like to know a bit more um, you know, from our anonymous doctor what her position is on that terrain versus um, germ theory and what she thinks actually really is happening behind the infections and potential spread of this because from what I've seen now apparently there's supposedly from the test if we can believe the test and that's another part of the question can we believe the test you know they're, they're doing folks postulate but yet then the makers of the uh, PCRs are saying that they're not there's a lot of false positives how, how do we really know can we be assured that there's any true science behind this I think that's my main question Thank you. Uh, Dr. Joe, uh, please, two minutes, uh, no longer. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's what I wanted to address as well, because there are different tests out there. That's what I can speak to for sure, because um, um, on the 11th or 12th of January, uh, the Chinese put out the sequence for this coronavirus in general, naming the family. And then there was a change, but it was really not really addressed by the WHO, although they changed the protocol to the German protocol, which I can speak to very well because we get lectures like every day from the developer of, of the um, German testing of, of the SARS-CoV-2. And um, for that, that we are do doing in our country, I can say that they are tested very rigorously to um, avoid cross-reaction with the human coronaviruses. I can't speak to the um, Chinese tests. I can speak to, can't speak to the um, um, CDC testing because the, uh, like every country was free to do their own and do their own verification. And as um, it was done by the um, coronavirus reference lab and I personally know this um, head of department um, you know he's really open and, and, and transparent with all he's gaining from it and he's not into uh, in um, vaccines and all that and he's actually kind of explaining the differences in in antibi um, antibodies that you need to have for um, for getting immune and that's um, what I wanted to um, uh, sorry answer to Paula um, because they have found out from these first cohorts in Germany that um, actually there's a pretty rapid answer from the neutralizing antibodies so you could expect after 10 days that these neutralizing antibodies if it's a mild disease get you rid of all, all the symptoms and you'll be fine again and um, but sometimes people don't produce them and that would be kind of after therapeutics you could do that um, transfer of neutralizing antibodies um, as a cure as well. Nobody speaks about that. It's always the jump to vaccines. But um, for my personal protection, if I would be on the front line directly, I'm, I'm counseling on the telephone and I'm checking on um, going out of um, I'm quarantine right now, but I would protect actually with the best mask I have and with goggles that are closing because it's not excluded that it's aerosolizing, but it's actually really at the point where you take care of these people that are known infected and um, infected. But the infection goes down in the second week. So it's actually the first week where we are between five and six days. That's what's really consistent. In, um, but that's kind of what I would address as well. Um, I, I'm not wearing a mask when I'm going outside because, you know, it's all, always about viral load. And um, I, I take, wear a mask when I'm going into the shopping mall because I want to show that I take care of, that someone else is not infected. But it's just a po um, polite statement. That's what is told us. Yeah, you were, you were saying uh, earlier that uh, it, it's really connected to the viral load. If you're in a hospital or in an ICU unit, it's appropriate to wear a mask, but when governments reflex to these central commands and have people in jungles and in deserts um, uh, wearing masks, um, it's, it's, a, it's a ludicrous, that's where it is a ludicrous pantomime. And it's also a multi-billion dollar business and commercial industry, an entirely inappropriate one at that. Um, Dr. Martin, is there any um, a situation in which you would find yourself endorsing any kind of a vaccination program whatsoever to address the corona uh, issue? The data now are sufficiently compelling 
to stop all animal um, all vaccines produced in animals for use in humans. The recent data indicating infectious cellular genetic sequences coming into humans from monkeys is essentially reversing some aspects of evolution. There's a risk in producing vaccines in animals of converting some of their cellular sequences into infectious components, and they're not good when they're introduced into humans. Not only that, some of these vaccine self-adapted viruses can act as a carrier of uh, cellular genes, including mutated genes. This has the potential of converting many genetic illnesses into a transmissible infectious illness. These data haven't have been published, but they haven't come into the public health debate yet. In my professional opinion, this is sufficient evidence to stop producing um, vaccines for use in humans, in animals, and in fact, addressing the issue, why humans can now carry in their genome monkey sequences, we don't want that, and even monkey sequences have gone into other animals, such as chickens, and so as an unfortunate, unanticipated adverse effect of vaccines. Given the argument that we have beyond the immune system, this alternative cellular energy pathway, and I'll go back to that concept of terrain versus germ, it was very clearly defined as terrain by Beauchamp being very generalized. What Pasteur did and immunologists followed was to narrowly define terrain as the immune system, immune defense. We go beyond that. There's more of a natural energy-based defense that the body has, which comprises, in my mind, a far more effective component of the terrain. What that also means is supporting that alternative cellular energy pathway is an acceptable alternative to vaccination because it doesn't carry the risk that vaccinations, at least the way they're produced using animal cells that can be contaminated with different viruses, using that the uh, promoting the alternative cellular energy pathway does not have that risk. The very positive comment I made earlier is that that pathway can be added to using activated, energized, or what I call now accelerated water, but it also accounts for a lot of the positive psychology. In other words, as humans, we're bringing this Kalia energy into the body continually. Probably the brain is a primary receiver and we have some conscious control over the efficiency of that receiver. So as I see uh, feeling going forward, it's to emphasize the fact that we have an alternative cellular energy pathway, different from the energy we obtain from food. This pathway has several unique features, including enhancing higher level brain functions, emotional intelligence, very effective at suppressing unnecessary inflammation in response to tissue damage, and that it can be conveyed using activated water when there's a deficiency, but ideally people can use their brain activity in a manner that will sustain this energy pathway and provide them the resistance to infections. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Martin. And of course, all, all that you're saying, which is absolutely brilliant, uh, begs the question, why the devil does the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, not, why are they not in possession of this science? Are there any pathways from an academic, a, a, a researcher, a medical scientist like yourself, 
are there any pathways available to your expertise to get up into these hallowed halls for the love of God? The, the, the commander in chief of the free world of the, of the United States, leader of the free world, probably doesn't have uh, this, this knowledge base. Why do we have a World Health Organization at all? Why do we have an AMA at all? Why do we have an FDA at all? Why do we have any of these institutions when they're clearly failing to transmit the genius that's coming out of health professionals, medical science professionals like yourself? They are an absolute firewall between leadership getting the real science to the people. And that to me is the real issue here that we need to look at. Dr. Joe, I'll give you the floor for one minute and then I've got to refer to Dr. Sandra Rose Michael before moving on to Judges uh, Alfred and Seven. Carry on. I just wanted to comment on that because it was actually the FDA with the Flexner report who um, expelled all the research on electrome and how the electricity and electromagnetic um, um, involvement of the body happens. It was in the early 19th, um, 20th century. And um, it was supposed to be from the electroshock that they banned it all. But from that on, we have that chemical, f um, a big pharma way, and not looking into the electricity and electromagnetics. So it's really banned. And so it's really hard to get in there. I need to do it kind of under the freedom of treatment, um, but it's really endangered in Germany as well. So it's it's really necessary to address these issues and um, energy in particular, like you address it, John Martin. I could k kind of talk to you for hours because I think we're using different names for the same thing. And that's so in so many disciplines, it's that way that, that you could kind of just find the same language or, or adapt your own to talk about this high energy physics that's happening in your cells and if that's impaired by a, a collective resonance frequency of a, of a virus for instance you know it's it's it, we need to understand this more and it's like 100 years we're banned by the fda to research well but this, 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 is, this is the point that we're getting to. And with this inquiry, what we've been doing with the International Tribunal for some years now is drilling down into the root here, the problem, these firewalls that exist between institutions and uh, bodies that are mandated. Um, uh, and, and in fact, frankly, are committing treason when they allow genocidal agendas to prevail and prevent the good science, the good health and medical science from getting uh, to the people and to the street. Dr. Sandra Rose Michael, do you believe that there is any uh, rationale for having any kind of a vaccination program whatsoever under any circumstances? I believe it's possible to produce safe vaccines. That's not what we have in any way, shape, or form being presented at this time. But the whole, the whole premise of it is really old and uh, outdated, outdated science. Uh, it, our real focus should be on how do we produce health? How do we create health? How do we stay healthy? Instead, we've been, it's a pharma cabal. It, it's, uh, you know, everything has been big pharma, rele you know, relegated to big pharma with the agendas, being, being aware as in intelligence um, of the background agendas for population control population reduction, but control through fear, through the media, you know, the propaganda, the propaganda machine to keep people in fear, to be able to control its old Hegelian dialect stuff, problem, reaction, solution. And so they create the problem, blow it out, out of the water. It's totally a pandemic that's been, I mean, it's created. And then make it that, uh, I mean, they actually came out, Gates came out and said, there can be no mass gathering. We can't go back to anything normal until there's mass vaccination certificates. Um, can I stop you there? What, it, does, does, does Mr. Bill Gates have any kind of medical qualification whatsoever? <laughs> Not as his training for sure, but you know, he's got a background of, of his father being a eugenicist. Uh, he ran Planned Parenthood. Uh, you know, so you have, and that's a whole business in itself of, of what's done with uh, the harvesting of the organs from, from the aborted fetuses and, and the 
the glands and the discharges and you know all the ch all the child trafficking issues that's behind all that as well but it's been a planned uh, agenda for a long time for population control for global control new world order there's many things and we need to rise we need to rise up as humankind and and go we're not going to take the city more and and we have things we have means to stop it and, we, and that's what we need to demand thank you commissioner sandra rose michael uh, i i just have a very quick question here uh, to the chief justice um and i'd also invite um justices uh alfred lambermont weber and justice seven to also speak to this is there any um is there any place uh, where, where civil disobedience is, is appropriate? Tearing down a 5G uh, mast that is planted outside of your child, your infant's bedroom window. For instance, the child has got blood coming out of its nose and is suffering from impossible headaches and the child is, is, is sickening on a daily basis. You've tried to get hold of the local authority, the local municipal authority. You're not getting any um, substance out of them. They're not even answering the question whether this is 5G or not. You know it's a 5G tower. You suspect it is. Is there any, um, is there any reason why you should not tear that mask down if you cannot get satisfaction from your local government? I would say you have a moral uh, obligation to tear it down the problem is that when you talk about legal obligation, the law really is divided into two parts. Uh, what we would call natural law, doing what is right and just, and the other is statutory law, where a decision is made by politicians uh, and by judges that something uh, is illegal and if you if you do it you go to prison now i was i i have a question of my own of to the panel i was looking at a, a short excerpt about sweden and they're not in lockdown their restaurants are open the people are in the parks and so on what is so different about sweden uh, from the other countries that they haven't got into lockdown. Well, there's an interesting um, uh, fact uh, uh, to, to note alongside that question, Chief Justice, and that is that in Sweden, they're famous for not having enclosures, houses abut other houses without having fences. So it's the most open uh, place in the world in that sense, uh, in terms of a first uh, world developed nation. Uh, but that's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, can anyone, does anyone wish to speak to that? Just a real quick comment. After 9-11, after I was reflecting on who should we blame. Uh, and I ultimately came to the conclusion that we could not blame the people that actually did it. We could not blame the American traders that enabled it. We ultimately had to blame ourselves. We have abdicated our responsibility for being engaged, informed citizens. And that's one of the reasons why I like being part of the ITNJ. It is doing its bit. Thank you, Robert. Um, Judge uh, Alfred Legmont Weber and, and, and Justice Seven, um, I, I'd love you to speak for a couple of minutes. You, your own venerable uh, common law court has recently issued a summation or a declaration of sorts which I um, was very grateful uh, to have read through with you, Alfred, uh, a couple of days ago. I think it's an exceptionally poignant, timely, and beautiful uh, document. Uh, I was very much hoping that you would share that, um, or at least uh, sum it up, uh, synthesize it for the Chief Justice here and for the commissioners and trustees of the ITNJ who are on this panel, and uh, possibly speak to um, how uh, an alliance of sorts, we'd be very happy. I've spoken with the Chief Justice earlier about this, about some sort of conjoined effort in continuing uh, to um, inspire others around the world to also create forums for discussion, uh, tribunals, 
um, ad hoc or formal in the way that we do them, either which way, I think we need to come to some unified consensus about um, what the position is that we're taking against rogue governance, treasonous governance, criminal, genocidal, sociopathic governance in some cases, not all, but in some cases. It, it, be, it behooves us to speak about these things boldly. And that's exactly what we've elected to do. And to any of the um, uh, uh, reporters, uh, journalists in the mainstream media out there who continue to take slingshots at the alternative media pundits and forums like this, who are actually doing uh, the right thing by people and planet, I would say to them, choose which side of the line of history you wish to stand on because the sands are shifting. This world is being reclaimed by humankind, away from the parent corporation, from the fictions, from the Masonic, Sabbatean, Kabbalistic agendas that have run amok for generations, wrought misery and bloodshed on the surface of this noble planet. That will not be withstanding for much longer. So to anyone who wishes to take slingshots, Choose very, very wisely what you say and what you do in the days ahead, because the world is changing. Judge uh, Alfred and Seven, please speak for a few minutes together um, on, on how you'd like to sum up this particular hearing as a court welcomed into this court. Yes, yes, thank you very much. I'll, I'll speak first, then I'll, I'll ask my, uh, my, my co-judge Seven to speak. And... I'm, and, and my summation is really coming from my, my early experience in 1969 as a cooperating, as, as a cooperating attorney um, with, the New York, with the New York Civil Liberties uh, Union um, uh, at the 1969 Pan Black Panther trial in New York where the FBI brought a specious uh, charges against the Black Panther for a, an alleged conspiracy to blow up the Statue of Liberty. We, we intervened in that case and filed the brief that was ultimately circulated nationwide, even at the Chicago 7 trial. Uh, and uh, the case went to the jury and was dismissed in a matter of hours. Uh, and so uh, with that uh, background experience, I'd like to just read briefly our, our last of the four findings of law and to commend and ask this tribunal, the ITNJ, to, to consider joining us in this call. Number four, this tribunal calls upon all ethical attorneys at law and law firms members of the bar worldwide to co collaborate cooperatively pro bono and in good faith to team up and bring investigation and legal court actions and prosecutions to promptly overturn and set aside in the interest of justice and public health any and all unlawful, unsubstantiated and unjust Australian past systems. We were greatly influenced by the Chief Justice quarantine, lockdowns, mandatory vaccinations, and or martial law orders as based on the finding of facts above. Such pro bono attorneys and law firms and tribunals can request their court, can request their courts to enter protective public orders, protecting the public from any further dangers arising from unjustified and unlawful quarantines, lockdowns, mandatory vaccination and martial law orders and from the public deployment of chemtrails, 5G, 60 gigahertz, and directed energy weapons deployments, i.e., these are all insults and dangers and weaponization against the public. And I would state that part of our mission here, um, uh, fellow uh, judges and witnesses, uh, is for us to mobilize the legal system and the court system to shut this down as we have shut things down, ranging from the 
outrageous uh, prosecution of the Black Panthers in 1969 by the FBI and the deep state in, in, in New York to many, many others. And with that, I uh, uh, turn it over to my fellow judge, um, Seven, who has articulated even further uh, charges. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, panel. Um, thank you for having me on. Thank you, Judge Alfred. Um, I'm coming at, um, to this panel with a slightly different perspective and quite unique uh, position. Um, that being that I actually sued 10 corporations and I won the largest case on public record uh, in regards to broadcasting. Some of the people involved in this case um, are from law firms and they make up key significant ringleaders within the deep state. And so I come to this panel today and support uh, Judge Alfred with the position of what we can do about this. Because obviously we have something taking place whereby we have, we have a situation which was, I think, perfectly described by one of the panel, somebody that was on the panel that I did yesterday. His name is allegedly Dave. He flagged up, there was a movie that was created, I think it was in 1998, and it's called Wag the Dog. Now, this particular movie is about a situation whereby there was about to be the ex exposure of mass corruption, okay, which could uh, affect, it would have affected every aspect of um, this particular um, president's and his, his public life. So what they decided to do was to manufacture an absolute hoax situation so that it would distract the public away from the scandal. And so what I would I propose today is that is exactly what's going on. We have COVID-19, we have coronavirus. Coronavirus, as we know, and it has been established on the, the British government's website, is a non-high infectious disease. It's not contagious and is overinflated and it's being done for a reason. COVID-19 is part of this whole uh, dramatization of a manufactured situation which some people have described as a scandemic and plandemic. That's exactly what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a hoax, a deception on such a scale never been seen before in the history of, of broadcasting or anything. We're talking about a hoax, 5G, which we know is being installed while everybody's in quarantine and countries have been locked down. We know that there's been the mass deployment of 5G technology, we weapons, outside schools, inside schools, inside, outside people's homes, inside hospitals. The 5G is actually a cover-up for yet another situation, which is what we're all turning our attention away from. This whole scenario that we have is designed to take our attention and take our eyes off the real issues here. And that's what I would like to draw the panel's attention back to. The first thing that I come to this panel with in terms of law is we address this in, in accordance with a rule of law which is called ultra vias. Ultra vias. Now, ultra vias is simply means beyond the scope of your powers. The, the power essentially is the people. We go through an electoral process and we bring these people into positions of power. We know that they're self-appointed. But the, 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 the illusion is that we all elect these people into positions of power to act on our behalf as members of the public because that is where the power is. The power is the people's power. 
Now, ultravirus in law means you have gone beyond the scope of the powers that we, the people, have given you. Everything that we're seeing effectively is a crime to cover up yet other crimes. And many of us know those crimes, 9-11, 7-7, Charlie Hebdo, Grenfell Tower. We have multitude, multitude upon multitude of crimes against humanity. We're talking about human trafficking, targeting of individuals. These things have been going on behind closed doors for decades, unchecked, and we've got to a position now where the mass populace is waking up to the reality of these crimes and this criminal enterprise that has been going on and now wants recompense. So one of the interesting things that I think many people were probably not aware of is that on the, on the 11th of March 2020, we had, I think it was in the House of Judiciary or in the Senate, there was an inquiry into human trafficking and 17 million cases of children being exploited was brought up to the table. Just before this so-called pandemic took place was this massive, massive inquiry into 17 million children being trafficked around the world. Okay, so that is part of what has been concealed. Now, in everything that they're doing from the bills that are being passed, which are t completely the replica of Nazi Germany is being um, unfolded before our eyes. We're talking about people being brought out of their home, dragged out of their homes. They're going from door to door, taking healthy people out of their homes. We're saying children are, can be taken by them now. And all of the things that they're doing can be in law nullified with laws like ultravirus, as much as they're creating these draconian um, lockdown procedures, we have laws that can over overturn them. And that's my emphasis, and that has been the emphasis of our um, findings in terms of looking at this whole corona hoax situation. So that's where we're coming. We're coming from the position of as much as they're creating laws to lock us down, we can reverse those laws. There are laws that covered that cover this situation, and that's what we'd like to um, bring the panel's attention towards. Re reversing the laws that are locking down countries. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you indeed. And that, that's so appropriate that you that you underscore there. Thank you. That that's very, very meaningful and, and very timely um, wisdom. Um, so, Chief Justice, I'm sure you, there's very little you'd be able to disagree with there, I'm quite certain. Would you like to comment at all? No, I, I, I don't disagree with, uh, with anything. Uh, I was listening to uh, David Icke uh, just recently, and uh, he really summed it up in a nutshell uh, in relation to the pandemic and the deaths. He said these people are not dying from coronavirus they're dying with coronavirus they're dying from something else and I, I think that's very true that every every death is now treated as coming from the coronavirus so we no longer have heart attacks we no longer have cancer we now have a no longer have liver failure everything is coronavirus and one of my colleagues in Sydney said uh, just recently, they say that we've had 21 coronavirus deaths in Sydney. They haven't mentioned the 20 suicides that went with it from people who lost their businesses, lost their jobs, lost all hope, and they suicided. That wasn't even mentioned in the press. And... Uh, I think it's fair to say that it's a hoax, but for some reason, the governments are going along with it. That it's, look, it's, it's happening in other countries, but I observe it firsthand in Australia. They're getting ready uh, to make these temporary rules permanent. Uh, one of the things that made me suspicious was 
six months ago, I discovered that the, the state police, the Victoria Police, were being trained in riot control and were getting new weaponry. Uh, and that was six months ago. It was as though they were getting ready for something because there is growing civil unrest uh, with the performance of the government. And uh, they've come forward with a financial package now uh, to uh, basically pay out of future taxation money to people to keep them quiet. And uh, I'd just like to make a, a personal comment. Paul, uh, Paula Woolley mentioned cod liver oil. It brought back memories for me because I was brought up on cod liver oil uh, because I'm English. And what you do in England with children is you give them cod liver oil. It tasted awful, but it made us very healthy. Thank you very much, Sir John. Um, I'm going to wind up now and thank uh, Justice um, uh, Alfred Lebmont Weber and, and just J Judge Seven. Thank you so much for bringing your court within this court. We're very, very grateful. Um, Thomas Brown, it's way past your bedtime in the Balinese jungle. So thank you, uh, Tom. You're continuing to uh, form, uh, format the white paper that we'll be issuing. Again, this is a white paper that we've been expressly has been expressly requested of us by world leadership. Um, and, and we will be getting that paper to them as soon as possible. There are a great many good leaders out there, and I'm talking from head of state level um, uh, down, that uh, are not involved in the globalist ploy, who are doing what they can to resist it, are not trusting the words of their councillors or their ministers because they believe that their governments, their parliaments, uh, their congresses have been corrupted. Uh, which, of course, is very much the case. Um, so we are serving leadership as well as grassroots with this international tribunal, and that will come out in the full, in the full light of day. Um, Robert David Steele, thank you very much um, for, again, just being so adroit. You know, Robert and I have been speaking fairly regularly lately, and we both agree that more or less that what we are dealing with is, uh, as, as I've been saying, inversion logic taking place uh, within a counter coup on a 5D chessboard. And, and that is very much what is happening. Uh, no question how you choose to skin this cat. There is not a linear rationale for what has been happening with this corona pantomime. It is non-linear. You cannot approach it from a linear perspective because you'll tie yourself in a knot and fall over. We are dealing with end of days stuff. These are huge, epic, biblical themes that we're dealing with. And it's an invitation to all of humanity to not get pulled into the spiral vortex of the apocalyptic narrative. That's a temptation, but it's the wrong one. In point of fact, we should be stepping back and disidentifying from this godless engineered pantomime. We need to reclaim our sovereignty. We must no longer abnegate our high calling, our conscience, our spirit. We must reclaim our humanity at this time because that collective becoming will be the thing that throws this devil off our backs. In point of fact, I'm one of those... Uh, perennial optimists who believes that we've already won the war and that this is a death rattle of a dying leviathan i will stand by that i've been for 21 years a very sober observer and witness of the alchemy of the bullshit of our civilization and i'm quite certain in my own mind we're on the brink on the precipice of tremendous upliftment and evolutionary shift we are necessarily seeing a reflection of the unresolved aspects of our civilization. And that's what's coming at us right now. Hold steady. Hold steady. We will see this through. I would also like to thank uh, Paula Woodley and, and wish you Godspeed, uh, Paula, um, as you make your way to the uh, U.S. hospital ships, mercy and comfort in the next couple of days. Um, our hearts go with you and our prayers go with you. Would you like to say something briefly? Please, yes. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be, you know, talking here. But I, I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, I was wondering, um, I, I feel, you know, from working at the United Nations, too, that um, 
knowledge is power. We want to be diplomats, you know, use diplomacy and trying to get what we need to accomplish here. And um, I, I personally feel that by this isolation that's happening, it's like I'm wondering if this isn't a way to suppress us so that we can't unite to form like a coup d'etat. Because if we have the knowledge and the power and all the answers and there's transparencies, I believe that 99% of the people that I know personally do not condone this. They, you know, and they're afraid to talk about this. They're being debunked if they want to do natural things. And I can tell you as a nurse, people do not want to take medications. They don't. Every day I do biometrics. They talk to me as a personal trainer. I'm an international licensed trainer. I'm an educator. I try to talk to them about diet to get out off of their medications. So what I'm trying to say is that, is there any way, because I believe the public are being suppressed and locked in so that they can't go out and talk. And to me, it's like this is martial law in, in a way. It's like a de facto martial law. But I, n nobody can believe that this is happening. People are depressed. But again, can we make uh, a right to the president to make an executive order to halt these ventilators and this intubation? Because the public, I believe, has been lied to. They do not know that this is life support. And there's religious barriers that this crosses too. Because if some people know that this is life support, it's against their, their, the will of God for them. They should not be kept alive on a machine. But people are not aware. They've been deceived that a ventilator is oxygen. So because of this alone, isn't this deception criminal? Isn't this something that... Yes, it is. We are dealing with endemic a criminality at, at an epic scale. No one is going to is going to uh, disagree with that fact. But the, there are also again other factors involved. Almost certainly, if indeed these mass arrests are taking place, we know about these uh, these sealed indictments. We know that there is a changing of the guard. We're seeing top executives and CEOs, chairpersons, trustees all around the world in blue chip organizations and institutions resigning all simultaneously like a dominoes there is something afoot clearly and uh, sequestering people at their homes again maybe to also mitigate into to some extent uh, school shootings the kind of gladio events that typically happen at times like this you know if there is a true changing of the guard that is for the betterment of humankind i would suggest that what we've been through with this uh, uh, quarantine and social distancing is is a soft demolition of the status quo clearly also a soft demolition or a hard demolition if you want to look at it that way of the global economy because quite clearly that ponzi scheme could not continue so there are almost certainly supranational interests conspiring to bring about catastrophic failure for nefarious ends has that agenda been co-opted by an earth alliance white hat however you want to look at the counter, the counter coup that appears to be emerging within the belly of that. We will see in the days ahead. Paula, again, thank you so much and Godspeed on your journey. I have to move on. I'm so sorry. Reverend Dr. Nancy Ash, thank you for representing the court as the trustee. Uh, endless gratitude for the work you've done year after year. Uh, Commissioner Sandra Rose Michael, to you again, thank you. This is the second hearing you've attended and we'll be inviting you uh, to the rest of them before we uh, issue any kind of summation or declaration. Um, Dr. Uh, Joe, um, thank you kindly. Uh, we'll be sure to obscure your identity as you're going right back into the fray tomorrow with COVID victims in your part of the world. And, and thank you so much for bringing your tremendous expertise. Dr. John Martin, I can only extend the same uh, salutation to you. Um, your, your genius is remarkable and what you've educated us to today should springboard to the world at large. And, and dear God, we can only hope that in the days ahead, um, tremendous genius coming out of medical scientists and health scientists and researchers like yourselves uh, will finally make it to the table of the true executives uh, who can affect policy change, stand down this godless uh, uh, behemoth that we've been dealing with and start to make people happy and well in a beautiful planet. It's really that simple. Um, so having said all of that, I'm going to invite uh, Paramount Chief uh, Sylvester. Oh, please, let me just say to Mark Pierce, media director and uh, co-host Imani Mamalushin, thank you both so much. I'd like to invite Paramount Chief uh, Silvestri. Um, no more than one minute, I'm afraid, Chief. But please uh, just give us a, a, a final word. Uh, your beloved peoples of Africa have been on the, 
on the pointy end of the stick of white man's poison for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. That we owe you more than any um, heartfelt apologies on behalf of our ancestors. I know that your ancestors are still awaiting remedy. Please, last word to you before the Chief Justice. Thank you very much. Um, it's a paradox because we have found the solution of these diseases, but we've been always been a victim of vaccine that we not used to. We even have the Edwin Smith uh, papyrus that is from our ancestors to deal with all these pandemics. So we have a solution of this, but because we are with a leadership that is already member of the Freemason, we cannot do anything because everything is imposed onto us. But we have all the solution, even our healers, they can cure this disease. So what we really are waiting for is this uh, deep state uh, uh, pandemic. I mean, these people, just the system to end. But we know also that is the end of the system. Because when we see children being abused, children are part of the divine world. So what is happening now, we know, because it happened to us in the past, then it's the end of the system. So we don't just push an old, uh, old woman to see how far she can fall. That's why we not saying anything, but she's falling. And that's all I would have to say. Chief Nakale, thank you so much. Very meaningful. Chief Justice, uh, please, last word to you, sir. And if you'd kindly uh, close this hearing, uh, we'll call it a day. Thank you. When I was listening uh, to some of them, I remember from uh, my childhood being told that you don't have to be as violent as the people you want to get rid of. Um, mindful of what Gandhi did. Uh, he wanted the English to leave India. So rather than fight them, he persuaded his fellow countrymen not to cooperate with them. And uh, they eventually got the message. And uh, uh, that's one of the things we can do that quietly let everybody we're in contact with know what the truth is and tell them not to be afraid to pass it on to, to other people. Uh, because they're getting desperate when, uh, before they announced the news this evening, I mentioned a, report, a commentator uh, had to talk about the burning of the, uh, the 5G towers, and this was a conspiracy, a fake conspiracy that's been totally rebutted by the government. When they come out defending something that we haven't yet accused them of, it means they're worried. So I formally close this uh, session and look forward to seeing, uh, if not all of you, but some of you at uh, future sessions. And uh, I'd like to thank Sasha for his great role as a moderator uh, and uh, Mark Pierce in the background, who's going to put it all together uh, and uh, uh, we'll have episode number three to show to the world sometime later this week or next week.